Thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I had a really hard time trying to figure out what to read and what to bring with me. I have a full-length collection out, and it's about living in Las Vegas and kind of coming to terms with impermanence in a landscape that never changes. I have three chat books. Are we ringing? There we go. Thank you. You're good. I don't want people to be sitting there like, oh, God. So, is that better? You good? So I have three chat books out. I have one um, that is about my son's sudden speech loss. I have one that is a contemporary and gritty Eve and Adam story. Um, and then I have another one that deals with motherhood. And so trying to put those together seamlessly is really challenging. And I also wanted to honor um, what's happening in the world right now. But I make it a really strict life practice to not talk about politics at a bar. <laughs> Hence my struggle. By the way, it's a really good life practice. I suggest adopting it if you do not. So um, I chose to go with one of my favorite quotes and find poems that fit that. And it's by Mother Teresa. And that quote is, if we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. And so I chose poems with that theme in mind this evening. And I'll start, this is um, my first, link collection, first full length collection, Gravel Ghosts. And that handsome gentleman back there, otherwise known as my husband, uh, has copies for sale if you are interested after. I will start with a poem entitled 100 Year Bloom. How many chances in this life do you have to meet yourself as someone else? To come back to the land where you were born, only to find among boarded windows, cracked pipes, shorn shingles, that you have already left. Trees mindless of the man who once soiled their roots, tended to a violet patchwork of catalyze when the evening frost called in an emergency of night. How instinctively, you would grasp the thinness of their leaves in a cupped palm, draw them close to your lips, whisper breath and heat to keep them through wintry hours. When exactly did you stop listening? How long has this landscape of your past been receding without a phone, just a junction box, frayed wires, a stranded motorist in the desert calling out random numbers? letting it ring and ring, waiting for an answer, a voice to recognize and say, yes, stranger, you are alive. But no one's home, no one. The greater parts of yourself are living someplace else. In the morning when you wake, you feel a loneliness of having kept something alive long enough to let die another night with another choice. I'm a big fan of starting off with the most cheerful material. <laughs> it's only gonna get darker. Um, so this book survived 10 years of rejections and close calls and was a finalist in several major contests. And finally, the beautiful editor at Glasslier Press said yes and published it. And things, magical things have been happening since then. But um, the process taught me so very much and allowed so much room for growth and discovery that I'm grateful for all of those horrible rejections and painful no's because of what I learned along the way. The title, Gravel Ghost, if you're not familiar with a desert flower, uh, when it blooms looks like a beautiful white parachute because the stem is so impossibly thin. So when you see a field of them, it's, it's really remarkable. And I chose it with the idea in mind that we're all tethered by so much invisible history. And I thought that was a really appropriate title. So I'll read the title poem next, Gravel Ghosts. What haunts in this landscape of blankets and windows is the low growl the wind makes when it tempers against the glass calling open acres across the main road where yesterday 
a coyote wandered into the stucco stretch of homes, and you knew then the feeling crossing you in sleep, tapping alongside each delicate inhale was your history stirring. Not even the summer monsoons, the drainage that collects low in the valley, the tolerant sage in the dry-walled canyon could predict such a survival. History catching up to you, watching patiently while you hide your bags behind the carport, half buried in bottle brush and thicket, while you take your time sipping wine in your bathrobe, slow and democratic, as if you had every chime in the world stilled to your request. But still, you cannot hush this calling. It's in your bones. Gravel ghosts pressing coarse grains into your skin while you dream the settled names of towns, the red barn door, bales of hay tightly wrapped in string, the catch of a loose door hinge, the picture of your father holding you and the trout you caught in the same lake that buried his father, how tight the sleeves of your shirt were or weren't. The picture hasn't been around for years now. There isn't a need. Only a word that rustles your sleep, sends you wandering the streets, crossings and lampposts, identical in every direction, until all things are the same, except you, frightened, scurrying away from night. Thank you. Um, one of the things that got me through 10 years of rejections uh, was reading, and I read absolutely everything that I possibly could after graduate school. And one of my poetry heroes is Rebecca Lindenberg. Um, she wrote the book Love and Index, and if you are looking for something to read that will just wreck you in every way possible, in every wonderful way, I highly suggest getting it. And so this poem is after that. It's after one of her poems, which is called Catalog of Ephemera. And this is entitled Ode to Loneliness. You gave me the slate gray light of morning. You gave me Bukowski and Yeats. You gave me winter, a mirror of shadows, stretched nights. You gave me hair and a ponytail, ripped jeans, a name at the bar downtown. You gave me rowdy men and a jukebox, a reason for pockets on my ass. You gave me topography, foreign collarbones and thick knuckled hands, matted tobacco hair, the closing time taste of beer and good enough, truck stop sandwiches and matchbox lips. You gave me mornings after, fetal, shivering in a bathtub, scrubbing invisible indentations. You gave me nubby towels and the smell of bleach, starched and faded bedspreads. You gave me wildness. You gave me monsoons that shook the walls so violently, I pressed the small bones of my chest against them, a conversation of vibration and heat. You gave me solitude and the smell of burnt toast, notes to myself, the unfinished poems. You gave me dimensions, which shapes my body could fit into, the smallness of my wrists. You gave me the close static between bodies. You gave me nearness. You gave me an apartment with bare floors, then a basement with wrought iron bars over the smallest frame. You gave me the absence of light. You gave me flea markets and coffee houses, the antique table with deep wounds. You gave me a year of blank slated mornings, bitter coffee, my fingers tracing watermarks and indentations, someone else's history. <laughs> Thank you. So this is really dorky of me, but um, almost everything is, but this is exceptionally dorky. So I was really excited to read one of my favorite poems in this collection because it's about a bar, and I was really excited to read it in a bar. <laughs> it's very meta. Um, so it's called Someplace Else. And uh, I'm often asked when I give readings or, or lectures what my favorite poem is and why. And this is it, and I'll let you decide why. Someplace Else. Let's meet in the middle of nowhere at a bar with a single syllable name and sawdust floors. 
I'll wear a hint of persimmon in public transportation. You'll press your skin into old books, pack a bag full of dead leaves, and when you see my eyes, you'll want to take off your shoes. The TV behind the bar will be on, soundless, and all the letters we've written will pulse when I place my lips against the thin skin of your wrist. We'll kiss and spit. Let the moments dissolve into the barroom floor, easy to sweep away. You'll touch each scar. I'll memorize your tattoos. And when we run out of easy silence, we'll steal lines from other people's poems, epigrams collected from bathroom stalls. We'll pay the band to play an extra hour, hold each other until we are weary or it starts to rain. So there's really no great transition between Gravel Ghosts and this book in the rooms of a tiny house which just came out. Um, it is an Eve and Adam story. And at its heart, I have been told that the poems read like incantations or spells. Um, I forced my husband to read it, and he said that what he got from it was that no matter how flawed we are, we're all deserving of love, which I thought was beautiful, and I think he just made that up to make me happy. Um, <laughs> it's okay, babe. <laughs> it's totally okay. But um, when I wrote this, I wrote the first poem, and I put it away, and the next day I sat down, and I just kept writing these poems. And they came out in order from start to finish. And when I wrote the last one, I knew I was done. I knew it'd be a chapbook. And I looked back and said, what in the hell did I just write? <laughs> so I'm still trying to figure out exactly uh, what the hell I wrote. But I'll read a couple of poems from this. I'll read the title poem. In the Rooms of a Tiny House. There are ants carrying pearl white maggots in the most elegant ceramic pots, dried mint leaves and tea. There's a stone painting of a dog praying, an etched window, lisps of fine point sparrows drunk in the wind. There's an oblong afghan, unlaced hooks of thread and stacked pages ripped from a holy book of poems. An apple sits uneaten in a drawer with rubber banded crayons a drawing of the eight-armed sea chewing fingernails off the dead. Eve's nipples snake line through the powder white spread on the mirror. She feels good news licking the soft linen in her veins, chants Om Shante Om. Her thighs touch in a design of pleasure as Adam sits naked nearby. Thank you. Burning barrels. She is learning to bleach stones and spot the purple goat's head blooms, how to pull them from their bull roots without spilling the seeds. She clears a field, gathers bunches in the burning barrel, and slips her shoes under the bed. She'll dream of fireflies trapped in the dimly lit restrooms, twinge at how brilliant they feel the wavelength of pale light glowing from their soft bodies, the females, flightless, unable to take to the air. <laughs> the applause never gets old. <laughs> I'll share two more from this collection here. Yeah. The week the soul is made, she lays wildflowers in a patch of glue to seal the lights, holds a match tip against the firm body of a tick latched onto her arm. Copper-breasted birds twitch by the window. She reads Emerson, wonders if the baby will root and latch, if her milk will be sour or pale as dandelion wisps. She knows she should be sleeping, but the needle trips and loops along the groove, a henna of sound. How easy it is to forget the lilt sweetening in her belly. (laughs) 
I'll share the last one here. It's called The Promise of a New Day. Mornings, cracked eggs, whisked light. His just birth cry beats the room, clawed as bat wings. They are latched in place, heavy footed, slowed with sleeplessness. Her nipples crack and bleed. She is rinsed, seedless. Purple streaked skin droops over her belly, a plum wilting. She paints her body with clay, stands under the ripe moon, washes her skin in a slop of roots, beet juice and salt. Her placenta floats on the skim. She feels splintered with misplaced hope, knows that the first day can be the only perfect one. Um, so I'm going to share some new work. I write a lot. <laughs> My husband will agree to that. And I have, um, I have a new book that I, I worked on because I went on this kind of uh, spiritual quest. So I, t I teach meditation and mindfulness at Prescott College. And after teaching, um, for my own self-discovery and understanding, I wanted to fully understand the differences between compassion and empathy. And so I went on this kind of spiritual quest of discussions and information seeking, and um, a whole new book of poems came out of this. And the way that I see the intersection of the two in their similarities and differences has been through motherhood. And so a lot of the poems are, are based on that. And these next two or maybe three um, are from this collection. So the first one is called Giving Her Son the World. What started as a layer of sheer tissue spindled around each rib, grew its own heart. The doctor said she carried high, which meant she was terrified of how far he would drop. Her body, a bowl to catch the drippings, to balance the rim of him from tipping. He formed fingernails and hair, her homegrown hoarder of bones and blood, stuffed the sack so she could feel the swelling pressure of him nip the alcove of her throat. She took stock, cleaned the last breath of each word, taught her mouth to forget their shapes, to clear room for his. She hid the broken bits so that one day she could explain the world, how there will come a point where grief will stink the sheets and after licking the windows, climb alongside, put its hand along his thigh and beg heavy for sleep. That for her, there were days where the burden of handing over this world was so heavy that she could not bend and lift him from the floor, that while he was reaching up, she was sinking deeper. I told you it was going to get really cheery. <laughs> oh, just wait. So, um, I've, I'm really grateful. I've had a, a really great run of success and have been published in many online journals and print journals and different publications. And I had this one dream of being published in Rattle. And I don't know if any poets here are familiar with Rattle. And they do uh, a weekly series. It's called Poets Respond and they choose one poem out of hundreds that come their way, and they're about current events. And so I submit every single week, and for two years, it was every Saturday at about three o'clock, you get that, thank you for submitting. I'm sorry, we're not gonna take your poem this week. And uh, I was having a conversation outside with my husband, and I clicked on my email to check, and I was like, thank you for submitting, blah, blah, blah. Oh wait, they took my poem. So, life dream fulfilled, dream big. Um, <laughs> This is the poem that was published there, so if you want to, there's an audio version too if you want to go and check it out, um, but I love Rattle and I'm super excited to share this. It's called Road Closure Aleppo. When I hear on the radio that your road is closed, I think of the desert monsoon that raised the edges of our highway, the only way out overcome, and how completely stuck. I thought it looked the way my mother did when she tucked her lower lip to damn the words that wanted to leave, but would wash out the bridge of every conversation she had to try politely to cross, simply because she was a woman. Which meant 
She had lips that would riven and silt. But closing our road did not mean that fruit and meat would rot scarce or hold us inside a city crumbed where raids shamble night and the sky is filigreed with smoke, not stars. And I do not have dreams where bullets knock door to door looking under beds for my children, wanting to gnarl their hair with sulfur breath. I imagine you, other mother, who know your children cannot swim, but that also they cannot sleep when the walls are broken piano keys thudding and hunger is a wing flapping against barbed ribs. And each lullaby is sung under a dry tongue waltzing inside of your mouth. When our road closed, the neighborhood kids inflated rafts to float the flood mile for fun. And it was lightning that blackened the ground, thunder that bucked against fences. I imagine if I could touch your hand, we would both say that destruction is a root of nature, but whelmed under our tongues, the word that means man. Thank you. Thank you for having me.